Okay, our next speaker is Kurt Kester, and he's going to talk about new product development and commercialization in cochlear implants, uh, a subject near and dear to me. I work with some of the guys at Hydrix that used to be with Cochlea in uh, Melbourne. Very good. Eager to hear what you've got. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. So, after sitting through the talks today, I've really been enjoying them, of course, but I realize mine is going to be a little bit different. And the reason I say that is actually um, in the cochlear implant space, it's actually been around for quite a while. And so, I think there's a lot that actually can be learned and inferred from this space that is going to be relevant for other types of bioelectronics and medical devices. And so I kind of set up this talk to share some of the things we've learned over the past 25, 30 or so years in the space and give you a couple examples of that. So something that in terms of the industry is a little bit more mature, but has some interesting problems and overlaps. So I thought I would kick this off with kind of describing what a cochlear implant is for those that aren't familiar with it. So a cochlear implant is for people that are profoundly hard of hearing or deaf and are experiencing sensory neural hearing loss. And the way the device works is the following. To kind of architect the system, you start with an external microphone. This is on a body-worn component that goes to a sound processor powered by a battery you can't see behind the ear here, connected by a cable to a headpiece. The headpiece is actually then the RF link to the implant. So it's wireless transmission of data and power through the scalp. The implant itself is actually seated against the skull behind the ear. And the electrode is inserted into the cochlea by drilling a mastoidectomy, the facial recess, and exposing the cochlea, really the round window of the cochlea to insert it. So if you're thinking about this anatomically, imagine a line straight in from your ear canal and straight back from the middle of your eyeball. Where those two lines intersect is where the cochlea is, and that's what you're trying to get to in the surgical procedure. So this is the implant shown up here against the skull. This is not quite the right routing for it, but it's a nice cartoon showing the idea. This is the lead, and then the electrode array is shown here wrapped inside the cochlea. And this is a histological cross-section of what that electrode would actually look like inside the cochlea. So in this case, this is the electrode array comprised of 16 stimulation contacts. Wires and electrode contacts, of course, are a part of that. And it wraps around about 420 degrees of the cochlea, at least for our device. So you can see there's not a lot of space. The scala is defined by the boundaries here. So there's the bony wall and the basilar membrane and the boundary between scala media and scala vestibuli. And my point being, you're basically trying to put an electrode that is around a half millimeter in diameter into a cavity that's about a millimeter in diameter without any ability to actually visualize it. So you can only see the round window and you're pushing it in from there. Okay. So that's what the device actually looks like. And then what we're doing with this is by picking up the acoustic signal here. <laughs> if you push the laser button, it really does back up on you. All right. Um, so we're bypassing the normal acoustic mechanism of hearing. So normally, of course, with acoustic hearing, Somebody's talking to you, causes the tympanic membrane to move, ossicular chain motion, and that causes fluid displacements in the cochlea, which causes hair cells to move, and neurons to fire, and then that ultimately is perceived as sound. Here, we're directly electrically stimulating the auditory nerve to deliver that same percept. So this is a neural prosthetic, which is functionally replacing one of the senses. So I mentioned that this space has been around a long time, and the way that we kind of think about it and talk about it is that we've actually gone through kind of three eras, if you will, with cochlear implantation. So the first being the early stage where hearing loss dictates lifestyle. You know, because of hearing loss, because of not having an available therapy as a deaf person, then there are things that these patients feel they can't do. It's isolating, can't talk to a spouse, it's more difficult to engage at work, it's more difficult to engage in my community. So then the hearing loss dictates lifestyle. There's this kind of middle phase where things have actually come quite a long ways in terms of the technology. So you have cochlear implants, it's a well-established therapy, people are using these routinely, and people are starting to say, well, with my cochlear implant, I can talk to my spouse at home, or I can hear in quiet, but I struggle at the office, or I can't hear a conversation at a restaurant very well. So the expectations are still kind of low, and you really have to concentrate and work at it but you're able to derive a pretty clear and pronounced benefit from it. This is where we are today, where people's expectations are informed completely by consumer electronics. And people are saying, you know, when I drive my car, it's really a hassle to try and figure out how to connect my cochlear implant to my phone. So can you just make this all really seamless, like one button push and everything just works and it all hooks up together? Or in terms of the audio features, some of this is borrowed from the hearing aid space where 
We have features and functionality, for example, where it can tell where the signal is coming from and where noise is coming from. So in this example, it really is, you can tell speech is coming from the right if you're driving in a convertible, so it'll basically shut off the microphones on the left and just give you speech in both ears coming from one side, which is pretty incredible if you think about it, that you start to get these adaptive and automated features to make it easier and easier to use the device. Because at least in our space, what people want, generally speaking, is to not have to think about it. You're wearing a prosthetic device, but you never actually want to think about it. You don't really want to engage with the device. You just want to live your life without limitations. Okay. So this is going to be kind of small in terms of the timeline to be able to actually read this. But I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. You know, the field first implantations were done actually in 1957 in Paris. So it goes back quite a long ways, as I mentioned. In the 1970s, there was a group in the US, a group in Austria, and a group in Australia that started working on cochlear implants. Today, those comprise the three major cochlear implant manufacturers. So everybody kind of grew out of that effort in the field. The first portable speech processor, so I showed you that picture where the component is actually behind the ear. The first portable one of those was actually developed and released in 1979, so going back quite a ways again. First FDA approval in the space was 1984, and the first BTE was 1998. So that's that form factor where BTE stands for behind the ear. Okay. I mentioned a couple of strategies here, the high res strategy and the Fidelity 120 strategy. So these are now strategies for electrical simulation that are taking advantage of continuous interleave stimulation, so kind of a modern strategy for stimulating the nerve. And Advanced Bionics was acquired by Sonova, which is a Swiss hearing healthcare company in 2009. And in 2013, we had the first launch of our joint commercial product, which was the Naida cochlear implant. And I mention this because, you know, if you look at the early part of this curve, as you would expect, you go from this phase where you do the first implants, and a decade goes by, and the first companies are starting to form, and another decade goes by, and you start to have some more advances. And you get to today, and you have new solutions coming out and solutions from each company coming out basically every year. Bimodal systems, cross systems, Bluetooth functionality, mobile applications. The rate of change in the field has just completely exploded. And it has, in that respect, become much more like consumer electronics. And this, then, is a, a figure that kind of shows, at least for our company's history, where we started out. I mentioned you know, our first generation of products. The sound processor was body worn, so a patient would you know, wear it on their belt, for example. And it would be about the size of those like 1980s cell phones. You know, it was pretty big. It was really power hungry in terms of actually getting this device to work. And as you might imagine, for things that people have to wear and carry around, over time, we tried to miniaturize this as much as possible to make them as small as possible. I mentioned the BTE, so that's the form factor for the first behind the ear sound processor. And again, you can see that we've driven down the size on those considerably as you go forward. I think you can also see a trend here that's pretty clear if you look towards the beginning. I look at these early ones and I think that looks kind of like a medical device to me. You get these kind of like brown beige plastics. They're not very nice. They're you know kind of squared off edges. It's like a rectangle. It looks like something that was functional, but again, not meant to be aesthetically pleasing or anything. By the time you get out here, you have a really different set of solutions. So I'll give you this kind of as an example of some of the pictures. Our latest solutions, they've got a whole color palette. You've got a color palette to match every color of hair. You've got accessories to match them. You've got hearing aids. In the case of our company, we make both of these components so we can make them so that they're identical for the left and the right ear. And a lot of opportunities that way to make the system a lot more user friendly and cosmetically appealing. And I think this is kind of an interesting reference point because this is how people are looking at the field today as people come into it, right? So in the time when these were coming out, you remember the Nokia phone, right? Everybody had one of these at one point. Then, you know, the first of the headsets that were actually coming out where people were carrying a cell phone with them all the time, you know, the wired headset connection, they were pretty big. It wasn't like today, right? Today, you can't tell if somebody's talking to themselves or talking on their phone. Those ones, it wasn't so hard, right? <laughs> The first of those Bose acoustic noise canceling headphones, the first iPhone came out at around the same time. And that's when you start to see, of course, there's an app for everything. People are using their electronics all the time. These expectations for mobile devices are starting to come together at this point. And in terms of the headphones, today they're a fashion accessory, right? The headphones that people are wearing around the big over the ear kind, they're fashionable. People are wearing them to make a statement and for comfort and because they like the style of them. 
that's quite a bit different. Or truly today, of course, you know, with the wireless kind, that's also what the expectation is. It should be simple. It should come in a tiny little box. It should be kind of cute to look at, easy to recharge, and I can just put them in and forget about it. So that's kind of what's informing people's expectations as consumers. And I'll take this opportunity to kind of point it out. In terms of our patient population, we have really a big population in the elderly, and we have a big population in pediatrics. And then everybody else is kind of uniformly spread across the middle, uh, you know, in terms of new recipients, of course. Users, of course, will age out of the pediatric group and into the adult group, but that distribution is kind of important because it informs who you're actually making these products for. And with the pediatrics, the majority of children with hearing loss are born to parents that have hearing. So what that does in terms of your dynamic is you might have a 26-year-old parent has their first child, finds out that their child has hearing loss through a newborn hearing screening and other tests, finds out about cochlear implants probably for the first time as a technology for their kiddo, and then starts looking at these devices. And up to that point, their whole experience is this, you know, in terms of body-worn electronics, things you're going to wear to listen to and hear, and that's what they're expecting. My one-year-old's going to get a cochlear implant. Well, what is it actually going to look like, and what is it going to do? And they don't want to see something that looks like this for a one-year-old. So that adds an interesting complexity to this, and I'd say that's one of the key learnings, is this people actually have to interact with these devices, and this is true for other medical electronics products. If people are really gonna interact with them, then they're gonna have to look and feel and function much more like the consumer electronics do. Yeah. And that's, you know, again, one of these examples of how you've got all this functionality. These, for example, act as directional microphones, they act as Microphones that can be used in the classroom, they can stream Bluetooth calls. There's a lot of functionality that's embedded in those. Okay. So this is a video from our company, and I'll let it do the talking for itself, describing you know, kind of what our products might look like in the not-so-distant future. Hi, Barbara. How are you doing? Great, thanks. How can I help you? Sometimes I have problem understanding people in noisy places like this cafe. Can you help? Oh, sure. Okay, fine-tuning then. I'm saving these settings so you can try them out. It is much better now. Great. Let's do an online follow-up in two weeks. Perfect, thank you. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Hey, honey. Hi, darling. Hey, Papa. We miss you. Sophia can't wait to see you. Our train will arrive early at the station. That's great. I will pick you up. See you there. Bye. Navigation. Show me the way to the main station. North station or the central station. Central station. In 10 meters, turn left. Continue straight ahead for 500 meters. Connect me to the console service. Welcome to 24 Concierge Service. How can we help you? Hello. What's a good restaurant close to the central station? We would like to recommend the Belle Gourmet. Sounds great. Book a table for 3 at 6 p.m. Enjoy your dinner, sir. What kind of flowers are you looking for? 25 uh, yellow roses, please. 25 gula rosor, tack. 25 gula rosor, tack. Yeah. You are close to Central Station. The station is to your left. What track do the train from Moscow arrive on? The train will arrive on track 7 in 5 minutes, which is 10 minutes prior to schedule. Shall I guide you to the track? No thanks. Connect me to the screen in front of me, please. You can now send images to all the screens on this station with a message. Why don't you give it a try? Here, waiting for you. Where are you? Where did you pick those beautiful flowers, handsome? Papa, Papa, we are here.
So the video for this is, obviously it's kind of aspirational, it's kind of cutesy, but it's not at all crazy in today's world. It's not futuristic very much at all. It's something that we're actually moving towards and the pieces are all in place to actually do this today. I thought it was kind of interesting for a bioelectronics conference as well to point out that that video was put together for actually one of the least cute parts of our device, which is we built a custom radio chip to deal with all the wireless communication protocols that our device actually uses. So this is for a radio that's built into the device. It's all about the connectivity piece. And it doesn't initially feel that way, but when you think about it, and it was kind of highlighted in the texting here, you've got the Bluetooth communication and Bluetooth low energy communication with your cell phone. You've got the Bluetooth connection with the TV at the train station. You've got the Roger communication protocol between the hearing instruments that the man and the woman were wearing when they were talking to each other in the train station. You've got the high band connection communicating ear to ear, so it's streaming to both ears. And with these connection protocols, there's also a caveat that for us was very important. You know, as an engineer living in California, you think everybody's got an iPhone, so you really only need to worry about connecting to that. But globally, iPhones are about 30 odd percent of the smartphone market. So if you want a solution for everybody, you need what we would call a made for all solution. You need to be able to work with Android and with other types of phones as, all to, as well to really be able to cover that space. So we spent a lot of time and energy making something like this to actually be able to do it. The other pieces in terms of you know, having an app that provides real-time translation or real-time transcription, again, we're talking about people with hearing difficulties and just actually transcribing conversation, that all exists today. It's a matter of basically plugging into them you know, underneath the hood on the smartphone. So this is all things that are gonna come to pass. But this is also what the expe expectations are going to be. 20 years ago when people were getting cochlear implants, they were delighted to have a device that enabled them to hear, talk to their spouse, and to work. And this is really where their expectations are going today. Okay. And that's kind of the point I wanted to make in terms of this. Their derived experiences with um, code, consumer electronics inform what they expect a medical device to do. And it's not just what it can do today. The pace of innovation, the pace of the improvements, what's coming out next year, what other goodies do I get with your device, that's all informed by this, as well as size and how it functions, of course. And again, the new users for this, you know, that 26-year-old with a one-year-old kiddo, you don't get any credit for how far the field has gone. They don't know what it was like in 1995, and quite honestly, they're not moved by that. They've got their own problems. They want to know what you've done for me lately. And this is what we can do for you lately. The other thing, you know, as you see in this example with the train station, it's really about having an ecosystem of solutions wrapped around the patient, at least for our types of devices. And what I mean by that is you now have a hearing prosthetic, you've got a mobile application on the phone, you've got the fitting software the audiologist uses, maybe you've got the enabling of telemedicine, which is what he was doing at the cafe at the beginning when he was talking on the phone to his audiologist, so they're making adjustments through the phone connected to his device. All of these things have to wrap around the patient in a pretty seamless way. And that's kind of akin to what you have with like your Apple products today or other devices today, right? You've got your iTunes and iCloud and the hardware piece and it all just kind of works seamlessly together. That's what we're looking for. Okay. And I, like I said, I think this is gonna be true for medical devices going forward. You certainly see it with things that people interact with. Glucose monitors, um, insulin pumps, other things that people are actually gonna be interacting with. This is what the expectation is gonna be. So, and since we're talking about commercialization and new product development, I would also say from a more mature industry perspective, one of the things you have to ask yourself is, well, who's actually your customer for this innovation? Is it the surgeon that's gonna implant the device? The audiologist that's gonna do the follow-up care, the fitting and the routine uh, <laughs> clinic appointments with the user? Is it the user themselves for the little kids? Is it the user or is it their parents actually that are the customer for this device? the hospital that's actually gonna buy it from you as a med device company, or the insurance or payer system that's actually gonna write the check that ultimately reimburses and pays for this device? And the answer, of course, is yes, they're all our customers. So we have to, again, in this story, have something for everybody, something that makes sense and resonates with all parties in this ecosystem. Okay. So, and this would be pretty typical, of course, for a med device company. You know, when we look at this space, the thing we're asking ourselves is really, what's the unmet need? What is the why? 
what am I trying to actually do and how is this gonna make a difference? And I think, you know, as we've talked through some of these new products today, the question will really come up is to make sure that there's data and insights you know, driven by the primary research, driven by interactions with the field and understanding the application and the current practice and the standard of care. I mean, that's kind of the benchmark. If you don't understand that, you can't actually figure out what, why you're addressing, the reason you're doing all of this. You can make a really cool how in terms of a product or a technology, but if you don't have this piece, you're a solution looking for an application or a solution looking for a problem, and that's gonna create an issue at some point in time. Okay. And again, I just mentioned who our customers are, which is everybody, so you have to consider it from their perspective as well. And then the how piece, of course. This is the actual product itself. What are you making? What does it do? What features are included? What features get left out? And that's usually a pretty tricky conversation is to figure out what makes this product and what has to fall to the cutting room floor. And of course, considering positioning for this. In our space, we're not alone. We're not the first company to come out with a product and we're not the only one in the space. So where does this leave you relative to your competitors? Do you have something new and novel? Do you have something that's similar to theirs? Are you playing catch up? Or are you expanding in some direction that others haven't gone in yet? And this is medical device, right? And so one of the things to consider is, well, how easy is it to get people to adopt this? If it's trialable, if it's a pretty small change to what they have today, if it's simple to explain what it is, it's gonna be easy. You know, if we make a cochlear implant that's smaller with longer battery life, that, that's not too hard to explain. And they can try it and see if that's actually true relative to what they have today, if you're talking about an upgrade. So that's relatively easy. If you introduce something completely new, it's not so easy. You know, something new on the surgical side, like introducing surgical robotics to the field, that's not easy at all. You have a totally different standard of evidence, you have a specific customer in mind, and proving it is gonna be really challenging. I wanted to talk about this because I actually think it's important, particularly as we have some of these applications where we're talking about implantable electronics, is consider the lifetime and the legacy patients that you actually have. So our device is unique for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons it's really unique is we're labeled to be implanted into patients as young as 12 months old. And other than hearing, they're typically rather healthy 12-month-old babies. So they're gonna have our device for a really long time, much longer than, say, a adult with health issues that gets a pacemaker at 75. And sure, pacemakers can go into younger adults, and a patient could get two pacemakers over the course of their lives, but we're really talking about a very different patient set. There's also the fact that our device is head level, which gives you some different issues in terms of surgical replacement, as well as the reliability considerations. And why am I you know, talking about these legacy patients? Well, as the technologies change and as things improve, since we wirelessly transmit data and power, if, for example, you break with legacy and say, I'm gonna make a totally new paradigm because it's gonna be more power efficient. Well, what are you gonna do with the people you've already implanted up to that point? How are you gonna service that population and ensure that they still have a pipeline of products that are sustainable and they get technology improvements and they get upgrades and you can actually service the product that they have if you break this legacy issue? And it's not the type of thing people think about right away. And quite honestly, our company didn't think about it in its first few years either. It's one of these things that I think we learned the hard way is actually it's a really important issue. And it's a really big issue if you don't solve it right away and think about it in advance because if you end up with a small legacy population, it's hard to develop the business case that says we can really support them and do everything we need to for them. If you have a large legacy population, then you can actually have a self-sustaining business where you have a product line just selling upgrades and creating new products for them. So thinking through some of these business aspects is really critical. And this was kind of my picture to illustrate that, right? In the case of a hip implant, there is really no legacy consideration. You know, they go into older adults that are typically not as healthy, and if they need it replaced, it's fine. That one goes out and the new one comes in and that's it, they never see it again. For this child wearing one of our implants, if we break that legacy connection so they can no longer get a sound processor from us, that's a real issue for them. And as a business, it's an issue for you too. Because of course, what's gonna happen if you do that once or twice and you don't have a plan? that word will get out in a heartbeat. It's a tiny community med device. And if you start making products and abandoning your legacy populations, everybody will know it immediately. And you'll have a lot of trouble getting new customers with your next generation of products. Okay. Life cycles, of course, are important for this as well. Med device lives on the market for a phenomenally long time, especially when you consider a global market. So really thinking through these issues from the beginning is critical. 
I'll make this point just kind of quickly. I think one of the things that's also worth considering in terms of what you're doing and if you're making new products in this space is, are you making a new product line or are you making a new product? Because sometimes it's a product. It's a one-off to address a specific need and plug a gap in your portfolio. And other times, like in the case of this gentleman, it's a strategic choice. You're gonna go out and build a team, and you're gonna make mobile applications, and you're gonna invest in custom chips and develop these radio protocols and make devices that make it all work. And you're gonna have this kind of multi-step process then to actually put this all together and make sure that you get all these features into the marketplace eventually. So how you think about it drives your time to market, it drives what investments you make and those thoughts about, of course, how you actually wanna execute on this plan. And kind of a final thought for this in terms of the new product development for us is we're finding increasingly, you know, with pressure from bundled payments and for evidence-based medicine, that the ask is really that when you go to market with a new product, you have to have evidence to show all of your stakeholders that there's a benefit to them. Not just like a story to tell, but actual evidence suggesting that there's really a benefit to them. So in the case of the user, again, a small, I'll use the example of a smaller device that's worn at the ear level. It sounds good. The user will be happy with that. It's smaller, it's lighter, it's more comfortable. The healthcare professionals will probably be happy too, because their consumers are happier. But if you're the medical center, the hospital, it's probably a shoulder shrug. If you charge me the same amount of money, I'm probably not concerned one way or another. But if you ask me for $1,000 or $2,000 more, I don't know that I'm feeling like I get a whole lot for that if I just make the device a little bit smaller. And for the reimbursement side of things, of course, they're really saying, you know, well, what is the benefit? What am I really paying for if you're gonna charge me $1,000 or $2,000 more for this at the end? And if it's all bundled together anyway, now you're arguing to increase the, the cost of the bundle to account for this price increase, and somebody's gotta pay for that. So having the evidence is critical to actually be able to make a coherent argument that'll drive that story forward. Otherwise, you invest a lot of money, but you don't necessarily see a return on that investment unless you're able to drive new units to sales or drive adoption or steal market share or something like that. So I'll give you just a couple of quick examples of some of the things we've done just so you can kind of see it in action and I'll wrap up here. So, you know, one of the things that we had developed in my time at Advanced Bionics was a new implant. And the reason why was because, again, we're at head level with pediatrics, so we needed a thinner implant. Ours was felt to be too thick. So what we did is actually redesign the entire hermetic package and the electronics that are on the inside to reduce the height of this package so it fits more comfortably under the scalp and doesn't, you know, kind of bulge out quite as much. So we were quite successful with that. We developed an implant that was 30% thinner. We changed the material set and changed process, took the opportunity to really improve reliability with this as well. Moved to a new technology platform and it's truly a platform in the sense that we can reuse it. But the time to develop things like this is substantial. I thought we actually did a pretty good job with it, but in end to end, it took us a full six years to actually get this out and onto the market. So it's not a quick process with these implants. <coughs> And consolidation is a trend, certainly, that you'll see in the medical device space generally, in terms of the acquisition, and you know, you've got Medtronic and Covidian, and that acquisition recently, Abbott, St. Jude, you'll see this all over the place. And in our relatively small segment of it, the hearing healthcare market, you see it as well. And I think part of the reason why is if you want an ecosystem of solutions, you can't do it all in-house. And as a cochlear implant company, you really can't do it all in-house, it's too small. So because we were acquired by a hearing healthcare company, you can start to see this come out where you have, now you have hearing instruments and cochlear implants. So a patient with hearing loss can move seamlessly from a hearing aid to a cochlear implant. You can leverage your supply chains and your distribution and your retail and the look and feel of all of your products can be consistent across your brands. And it's something you just couldn't achieve as a cochlear implant company alone. Or the investment to make that chip I was talking about before would be a really heavy investment for a cochlear implant company. But in the hearing aid space, it makes a lot of sense. So you get these synergies, and that's why you're seeing some of the consolidation. Yeah. So I mentioned these two before. They were on my little timeline. Uh, you know, we have Sonova acquiring Advanced Bionics in 2009. And the Naida portfolio then actually becomes our first joint product where you combine the hearing instruments and the cochlear implants. So now they're running with the same electronics package. They can wirelessly communicate with each other. They've got the same naming convention, same look and feel and really brings this together, makes it easier for the professionals as well. We're not done with this journey, but it really set the stage for us and set the expectations in the field for what our company was going to do with this. And again, after the acquisition, even with all the resources that were kind of poured into making this a quick success, 
it was still three years, and that's just for the body-worn portion of the electronics to get this done. So it was quite a while to make all this actually come together. All right. So really quickly in terms of summary, you know, I think cochlear implants have certainly improved in terms of performance, the functionality, the aesthetics of these devices. With the new products in MedTech, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge that's necessary to actually be able to make these. The cross-functional teams that are involved are quite large and span every discipline of engineering. When you consider the customers, just remember there are multiple customers in this space and they all really need to see what's in it for them. And I think the field is moving towards this model of consolidation and creating these ecosystems of solutions around the patients. And I think we're gonna see that across the field of bioelectronics. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, is that video that you showed online, is that in the public domain? It is not. No, is it's... Any way I could get a copy of it? <laughs> I thought that was really creative and, you know, sort of showing what the future of this field is going to be like. And, boy, I, I sort of envied that guy with hearing loss. He had so much more functionality than I do. Mm -hmm. uh, do you make a whole range? I mean, you could integrate this in, in a, something for hearing impaired that don't have cochlear implants, and it begs the question that came up earlier. Is there any way a normal person would opt to have some sort of device that would extend their functionality? Is that something that's on the radar? And I, you know, I think it is ultimately for this one. Now, with hearing aids, nobody's going to opt into cochlear implants unless they actually need yeah, it. Yeah, no, but, but... But hearing aids, the answer is probably yes. And, so and even for people without hearing loss, I mean, you're aiding hearing different ways other than amplifying signals. You're, that's, language translation and being able to hook up to give me the audio from the screen. I mean, that'd be a wonderful functionality. Is that something that's on the radar for someone? I, you know, I think it is on the radar for people. Now, when it'll actually come out is kind of an open question. There's another push in the hearing aid field towards over-the-counter hearing aids, mm -hmm. and that will also change things. Once you move to a model of over-the-counter dispensing, then, of course, there's nobody really acting in the same way as a gatekeeper to prevent people sure. with normal hearing from a course you buying your these. functionality however you want. Yep, and then the question is, what do you do in terms of amplification? You know, and a person without any need for amplification could wear it. Like every app, that would be a user selection. That's something that you would yeah. choose. Yeah. I want to thank you very much. That was a, a really great talk. I enjoyed myself very much. Um, so just a, a quick question. You know, when I put on my glasses the very first time, I didn't have to learn how to see. Uh, when I put on my bifocals for the first time, I did. Mm -hmm. um, but my understanding is with a cochlear implant, there's a pretty steep learning curve um, in terms of deciphering the sounds that come into the ear uh, and turning those into a, a signal that the brain processes as a meaningful noise. So you talked a lot about the aesthetics and the performance and the reliability and so forth. Has there been similar progress with regard to the other aspects of the cochlear implant over the last 40 years? There, there has been. So, you know, practice has changed a bit in terms of really trying to make sure that it's a cross-functional team that's providing care and services. There's oral rehabilitation and follow-up and speech and language rehabilitation services that are part of the follow-up. You know, as companies, we've put together materials that are kind of like materials that parents can use with their kids, for example, and whether it's online or it's in an app or it's hard copy materials, it's, it's, you know, all sorts of things that you can work on to really get the practice. And the big issue is really it's a practice issue. So can you get enough time speaking and listening with the device to really become proficient with it? Outcomes vary considerably depending on what your starting place is. You know, in an adult that had sudden hearing loss that gets implanted six months afterwards that was postlingually deafened is probably going to do pretty well. An adult that's 35 years old that has never heard but decides to try an implant in one year may not do real well at all. Kiddos tend to do really well. Um, that's pretty consistent and they tend to be implanted bilaterally because they tend to have hearing loss in both ears. And they seem to, again, you know, as a general rule, they do quite well. Uh -huh. But it takes a, a lot of that follow-up care. So yes, that's all kind of moved along with the field. We could always do better. And as a healthcare system, I think we under-reimburse and under-invest in rehabilitative services. That's an issue across the board, but it's no less an issue here in terms of those services. When you listened to Matt's presentation, did you say, gee, I wish our intracochlear catheter had 65,000 electrodes on it? Is there any opportunity to improve the refinement of the signal, perhaps even to make it better than native hearing? 
You know, the short answer is no. Um, and the, it's, well, so that's the easy answer, but well, we've looked at this. So there's a couple of issues with it, and at least in terms of what we're doing with it, increasing your contact number has a pretty limited bang for your buck. And the reason why is you're relatively far from your target neural tissue, and to have the perception of loudness, you need to actually recruit pretty broadly. Mm -hmm. So if you made these really fine scale contacts, you couldn't push very much current, and the current is proportional, or charge delivered, I should say, is proportional to the loudness. So if you had these very fine contacts, you wouldn't deliver very much um, charge out of each one, and therefore you wouldn't have loudness growth, unless you ganged a bunch well, of them together. What about a spectral resolution? You know, you, there's an app on my phone mm -hmm. where I can increase the frequency of a pitch, and all the young engineers in my facility can hear up to 14,000, 16,000. Yep. I can't hear anything above about 11,000. Now, so, I know when I was a baby, I could probably hear 19,000, so, and my dog can hear 22. Yeah, so you know, people talk about in terms of the normal ear, if you will, having 30,000 neural elements, something like that. And in principle, you could excite each and every one of those individually. But you really can't do that electrically. And if you had those contacts, again, it's not so much that you can't stimulate at 14,000 hertz. You absolutely can stimulate at the tonotopic location of 14,000 hertz. The problem is if you want to actually hear it, then you need to actually have the charge to get the loudness, and you can't, because of electrochemical safety limits and other issues, you can't pump enough charge out of a tiny contact to give you that, unless you pumped a little bit of charge out of each one, and then you're effectively right back well, to where you are What if your electrode today. went through the cochlea and it was a little sharp piece of metal and went into the nerve? Uh, well, then the surgery gets to be a lot more. I don't know, man, does it? <laughs> People have looked at that. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so as, a, as a user of your AB Harmony, a satisfied user who only had a two-week learning curve, by the way, um, <laughs> thanks to you guys and thanks to you guys in the company for everything you've done. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to hear you today if it wasn't for my advanced bionics instrument. Um, so my question is, uh, uh, I start reading statistics as I get into the uh, social aspects and the kind of justice aspects of mm -hmm. cochlear implantation. And only one people out of 10 in the world who would benefit from a cochlear implant kind of has one. Then you read that there's a lot of diversity in the outcome, which is linked a little bit to socioeconomic status, especially in children who need a lot of follow-up auditory rehabilitation that's not necessarily being covered by the insurance industry. So my question to you at Advanced Bionics is how are you guys dealing with these societal aspects and worldwide aspects of improving access and outcomes um, so that you could have more societal impact of your device? Yeah. I think it's a great question and it's a really big issue with this. It's related to what I was saying before where I think a big part of this is we underfund as a society, certainly in the US this is true, we underfund rehabilitation and we underfund pediatric rehabilitation, and there's probably lots of reasons for that, but I think for those that are in these disciplines, whether it's occupational therapy or physical therapy, like that's gonna be true across the board. And that's where we put our time and energy in terms of our professional organizations as a field and in terms of our resources as a company, that's where we put our effort in terms of advocacy. And it's less about expanding indications, for example, or things like that, it's more about can you fund the services that the people need to be successful with these devices and that make these programs <coughs> successful and profitable in both private practice and in our healthcare system so that the services are provided to those that actually need them and the follow-up services are provided? Globally, it's a little bit of a, a different issue, right? Because depending on where you are in the world, who's available and what the network looks like in terms of healthcare professionals that are actually available to provide these services varies widely country to country and how it's funded varies country to country. So then the answer gets a little bit more complex in terms of what you can do and what you can support. But as a general statement, that's where our advocacy has been going is towards issues like that. You may not be the best person to ask this question to. It may go to a doctor instead, but uh, a physician uh, instead. But when you mention that you implant a number of infants who are otherwise healthy, it reminded me that there are a number of syndromes, genetic, non-genetic, and other and of unknown origin, where infants have severe hearing loss but also have profound intellectual disability and often a variety of other yep. physical problems. Are those children implanted with cochlear implants often? Yes, yeah, so I say, 
predominantly children without other issues or otherwise healthy. I think the statistic is something like, and it varies country to country, but something like 35% of our pediatric patients in the U.S. have multiple diagnoses. And yes, they still receive cochlear implants. Is there anything particularly tricky about the procedure with them? As, as far as I know, um, there, there's a few cases where um, it's more medically difficult because the cochlea is malformed. So the cochlea is formed relatively early in development. Mm -hmm. And so if you have issues in the anatomical formation of the cochlea, you're probably going to have some other issues as well. Because this is, we're talking like eight weeks, 12 weeks, that type of age, you're having um, some of these developmental issues manifest. So that part can affect it, but mostly it's not the surgical piece. Mostly it's the other thing. So if you have a combination of, for example, um, Down syndrome and hearing loss, you're going to have a lot more difficulty getting subjective feedback from that child about if it sounds good, if they're hearing anything, you know, and judging their responsiveness to this. So determining if they're getting really benefit from that device is more complicated and usually involves more objective measures. And for us, objective measures means electrophysiological measures in addition to subjective feedback. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. That was great. You're welcome. Thank you.